It's possible to make a case for saying that uh, flexibility is an employer-driven thing, that uh, the employer wants the workforce is prepared to make adjustments, to change, uh, you know, change their work patterns, etc., as the uh, demand for their services alters. Um, but increasingly, the view which is taken is that flexible work is something from the side of the employee. Well, hello and welcome to the IEA's YouTube channel. I'm Annabelle Dunham. I'm Director of Communications here at the Institute of Economic Affairs. And I'm delighted to be joined once more by our Editorial and Research Fellow and Professor of Economics at the University of Buckingham, Len Shackleton. Now, today we're here to talk about flexible working. This is a topic that we are hearing increasing amounts about, particularly since the coronavirus pandemic. During the pandemic, around a third of the UK workforce was working from home. Now, workers' unions and the Labour Party are really keen to strengthen worker rights in this particular area. And even the Conservative manifesto from 2019 included a pledge to consult on making flexible working the default unless employers have good reasons not to. They've subsequently introduced a right to request flexible working from day one on a new job. So Len, let's just start with how we define flexible working, because I think it's often conflated with remote working, but in fact, there's a lot more to it than that, isn't there? There is, and it's a kind of contested definition, Annabelle. It's possible to make a case for saying that uh, flexibility is an employer-driven thing, that uh, the employer wants the workforce is prepared to make adjustments, to change, uh, you know, change their work patterns, etc., as the uh, demand for their services alters. Um, but increasingly, the view which is taken is that flexible work is something from the side of the employee, mm. that they're looking for changes to their lifestyle and so forth, which will uh, be facilitated by a more flexible pattern of working and uh, some of the things which uh, are associated with this might be compressed weeks where mm. we do f for, for longer hours or some four days of longer hours and uh, and you don't work on the, on the fifth day. Mm. Uh, it might be things like um, term time only working for, for parents. Mm. It might be um, um, part-time or job share mm. arrangements, things like this. So it's, it's a pretty broad uh, category, I sure. think. Sure, but nonetheless, which includes working remotely? As suits the oh, people. indeed, yes. yes. Working from home is a, is a, a key demand of uh, a lot of workers these days. And I touched on them earlier, but what are your views on what the main parties are currently offering? The, uh, the Conservatives' uh, position is uh, one of um, extending the uh, right to request flexible working mm. so that uh, you, you can get this really essentially from day one of, of, of your employment. Mm. Um, the, the Labour Party wants to push it quite a lot further than this. Sure. Um, the, the, the position with, with requests for flexible working has always been that the employer can turn this down mm. um, if they can make a business case for saying, look, we, we just can't do this. Um, and that is still you know, the, the position which the Conservatives want. But it, it looks like the Labour Party wants to push this further, so it's really a default position that yes, we will accede to your request mm. unless there's something absolutely, you know, uh, unbelievably difficult about doing it. Sure. So um, I think that th that's a difference of emphasis. I think if the Labour Party were actually in power and trying to pass legislation in this area, they might find it more difficult than they think to, to, to alter the mm. position. And isn't one of the problems that there isn't legislation in place to say that employees can't request a right to fle flexible working from day one? It's not entirely clear what the problem is that the government is trying to solve. That's true, but uh, it, it is giving a boost to, you know, uh, it, it must be difficult for people coming, you know, who have got problems with their work arrangements. Mm. Uh, you know, people are often very nervous of this, particularly uh, if their job is in a, an area where, 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 you know, where the business is not doing particularly well or, or there may be issues like that. So I guess giving people a firmer right uh, mm. to request this is something which uh, you can understand why the government wants to do it. 
And we do hear a lot about the benefits of flexible working at the moment. We read surveys of HR man managers which um, emphasise the productivity gains, uh, the well-being of employees. It seems to be mutually beneficial for both the employer and the employee. Of course, we talked about the Labour Party and how it really wants to make flexible working a force for good. Meanwhile, you have some of the unions uh, discussing how it can achieve things like narrowing the gender pay gap. Do you, do you think they're right or do you think that we should view this with a, a little bit of scepticism? I'm always inclined to uh, have a little bit of scepticism when, when you know, there is a, a very strong consensus about something. Mm. It does suggest that people are, are not necessarily thinking it through but are just following the line which everybody else is, is talking about. Mm. And, and certainly uh, HR managers are a pretty unrepresentative group. Mm. They've been schooled in a particular way. Uh, I used to run uh, years ago um, a, a major business school which had a lot of um, you know, personnel people being trained and so on. And, and there is a, a kind of mindset which, which, uh, it, you know, which follows the, 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 the common line. Um, yeah, I mean, there are potentially benefits mm. for, from, for both sides. Um, it is possible to imagine uh, that uh, productivity may be enhanced if people are happier in their work. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, you know, um, studies which have looked at this suggest that maybe absenteeism is reduced, that uh, turnover is reduced, mm -hmm. um, uh, people display more loyalty to their employer and so on. The problem with imposing a, a law on this though is that Whereas you can perhaps show that uh, firms which have introduced, uh, you know, generous flexibility um, 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 arrangements uh, gain from this, but it doesn't necessarily follow this if this is extended to the entire sure. uh, population mm -hmm. that, that um, you know, employers can get a first mover advantage, if you like, by, by introducing these things. But if it comes as a diktat from mm. the government, mm. then that's a rather different matter, I think. Exactly, and there are already thousands of voluntary arrangements in place where employer and employee have come to uh, an arrangement that suits them best. Another benefit that I hear about quite often, and I can certainly believe, is that it enables startup smaller businesses to compete with incumbents if they're able to offer perks um, such as flexible working when perhaps they can't compete on salary grounds, but we can move on for, from some of the benefits to really explore why it is that compulsion is needed. Of course, if it was mutually so beneficial, then we wouldn't need government regulation uh, enforcing it. And I would say that recently I've read quite a few articles that have cast out on some of the perks of flexible working. So, for instance, Larry Fink of BlackRock said at Davos that remote working has not worked. Uh, the British boss of Citigroup recently recently warned that slackers working from home will be hauled back to the office for coaching. So I, I wonder what you, what you make of that um, and whether it supports some of the concerns that you might have that flexible working is, is not all it's cracked up to be. There are issues around working from home. Mm. It's, it, 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 is, uh, it is difficult to monitor um, work which is being done very often. Um, there are problems with younger workers who don't get to experience the mm. office culture. Well, Rishi Sunak was very worried about that. Uh, yes, indeed, yeah. and don't you know do, don't get the experience of learning from others and mm. so on, which uh, is the way in which people pick up a lot of their skills. Mm. You know, we we tend to place too much emphasis, I think, on formal education and training. A lot of what we do, as uh, it has been for millennia really, mm, is mm. picking up skills from working with other people. Sure, um, learning by doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, there are problems with, with this. Um, and uh, you, you, raise, you raise the question of, you know, if it's so wonderful, why isn't everybody mm. doing it sort of thing? And I, I am, and things I've been thinking about this, things I've written about this, suggest that the reason why it's, it's not generally um, um, you know, introduced without government intervention is that there are costs to it. Mm. Employers um, do incur costs from s some types of, of, of flexible arrangement. For yeah. example, things like job shares, mm. where um, you've got 
two lots of training, uh, two lots of HR sure. stuff yeah. and so all forth, all these extra costs. And there are, you know, you often see arrangements where, where you get um, people sharing and have a common day in when they, when, when they come in together. And that is obviously doubling the cost associated with that. Sure. Um, things like, uh, you know, uh, allowing um, parents to uh, leave at uh, 3.30 to pick up their mm. kids from mm. school. If the business is carrying on till half past five, you've got to have somebody to cover sure. that that period, and uh, you often get some. You often get resentment in, in offices mm. where where um, you know people are having to people without children, let us say, are having to cover for people who've got children, things sure. like this. So there, there there are difficulties involved with it. There are costs associated with it. And where you've got costs, of course, um, where do these costs fall? Oh, yeah. That's the question. Um, that a, a lot of politicians just assume that, oh, well, business will absorb these costs yeah. in some magical way. Um, but that, that isn't how the economy works. Mm. If you've got a, a cost imposed on employers, they're going to try to unload this cost somewhere else. Sure. In terms of raising prices, possibly. But perhaps more commonly in, in, in very competitive markets, markets, passing the cost on to the employee in mm. some sense. Um, so, in know, the form of lower wages. In the form of lower wages. Yeah. I mean, think of it like this, that, that you know, you, your, your, your um, effort for an employer is worth, I don't know, £50 an hour or something mm. like that. Now, if you incur additional costs, um, this means that you're able to pay less than £50 mm. an hour. And so over time, I mean, you won't come in, in terms of actual reductions in pay, but what it will mean is that over time, pay won't grow as rapidly mm. as it would have done otherwise. And I think um, this and other forms of, of employment regulation are one of the reasons, of course, why real pay has not been rising in mm. recent mm. years. And the more we try and load costs onto employers, the, the more difficult it is for employers actually to uh, increase pay uh, and, and yet still run a profitable business, particularly smaller employers, I think. And do you think the politicians have have made this link at all between increasing labour market regulation and very slow wage growth or do you think that they tend to seek favourable headlines, do you introduce kind of sh quite short-termist feel-good policies and don't necessarily think about the long-term impacts? There are there are some politicians who understand this mm. but I think I think you're right that the, the most Politicians are not economists. They don't think about these things particularly. They just assume that it's all, oh, employers will rearrange stuff and it won't incur much for sure. a cost to them and uh, uh, in any way pay is determined by other things and, and so on and so mm. forth. But, um, you know, you, you do have to think about these mm. things, I think. And I mean, just to broaden out from flexible working, uh, where have we seen the growth in labour market regulation over the last decade or so? What, what sorts of measures has the government brought in? What's it been imposing on employers? And could you say, to be fair, that some of that has been necessary? It depends what, which which side you're, you're looking at. I mean, mm. we, we've long had uh, a lot of health and safety regulation, for example, which protects workers. We, we have very, very low accident rates now compared with, with 30 or 40 years ago. Um, you know, the workplaces are much safer mm. and, and we, we pay much more attention to things like to mental health problems as well as to, sure. to, to physical things. So some of that is, is the result of regulation. Mm. Some of it is, is beneficial in that sense. But we've had a lot of regulation which is aimed at trying to improve uh, the position of workers, uh, which doesn't necessarily always often do that. Um, we've seen, uh, obviously, things like the introduction of um, the the national living wage, which is the, the Conservatives brought in under under George Osborne, mm. a, a surprising move actually for Conservatives who had long opposed the minimum wage re uh, legislation, and that may have had some benefits, but it it, it, it does. Uh, it does mean that, that the costs are increased and, and that smaller businesses may find it very difficult to do this. And mm. of course, where you find uh, you've got to 
uh, pay extra for workers in one direction, you may cut back in other areas mm. like training, for example, sure. uh, or, or, or you may, you know, when the national living wage was introduced, there were some very very funny things going on. Uh, you know, like I think it was Cafe Nero, and uh, forgive me, Cafe Nero, if this wasn't you, but uh, where they, 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 they said, oh, well, we're not going to allow you to have a free panini at lunchtime, right. you know, because, because of the extra costs sure, which sure. we incur. Uh, so, so uh, and you'll find that, for example, uh, many of the things which have uh, broadened the, the concept of discrimination in the labour market mm. and, and uh, protected characteristics of workers may actually uh, act against recruitment of groups of workers who are likely to take, you know, take action under yes. these headings. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, for example, disability, where we, we have a very uh, small proportion of people uh, with disabilities who are actually employed. And that may be partly a consequence of the way in which, um, you know, they're, they're, they're protected under, under discrimination mm. law. I mean, it's paradoxical, perhaps, but th these things happen. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, very few politicians yeah. actually think through what the consequences of these things are. Um, and you talked earlier about the change in emphasis and how the onus was perhaps shifting towards the employer having to explain why and justify why it might not be offering flexible working in this case. I, you talked also about how the employer might pass the costs on to employees or perhaps stop providing them with free paninis at lunchtime. But I just wondered you know, how employers view the risk of go, being taken to an employment tribunal because you do hear about these cases. Uh, there was one a couple of years ago where a mum um, was denied uh, the right to leave work at 5 p.m. to pick up her child from nursery. She took her employer to an employment tribunal and was awarded £185,000. Do you think that there's a risk as we increase the amount of regulation that we're going to see employers being increasingly cautious in response? Because going to the employment tribunal, even if they may feel that they've got quite a robust case, can feel like a roll of the dice. I think I, I think you're right. The the uh, uh, I think one of the, one of the dangers is that because of the, the they fear these consequences, mm. they will often agree to uh, a, a, an employee request something simply to avoid the the, the potential hassle which sure. is involved. And it is difficult. I mean, it's not only the the possible cost to the a company or the organization mm. but also to the individuals concerned I mean I, years ago I, I, I was in, in working for an organization where um, the uh, head of security wanted to work uh, a compressed week of four days mm. and also wanted to take one of those days working from home which would have meant that they were off-site for two Right. two days yeah. and the line manager um, refused this yeah. request yeah. and I was on an appeal panel for it and it was a horrendous experience for everybody concerned there were you know anger people being called names right. shouting right. tears all this kind of stuff yeah. and you'd think that next time an issue like this came up they wouldn't bother, they'd no. just say, yeah, OK, yeah, what if you want? The uh, and yeah. we'll find some way of dealing with this. We'll employ yeah. somebody else to come in and, and this yeah. kind of thing. And so I, I think there is a danger in, 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 uh, in, in this kind of arrangement, mm. but maybe that's what we have to accept. And that leads me quite neatly to my final question. I think Labour and the unions talk about flexible working not just being for the privileged few, but do you think we need to accept that there are simply some instances in which flexible working isn't possible? Well, some types of flexible working just aren't, aren't going to be possible. Mm. I mean, it, if you are, uh, if you are um, a, a surgeon or a, a firefighter or something, mm. Um, you can't really work a four-day compressed week. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you're not working on the fifth day, somebody else must be employed to do this mm -hmm. because you can't have a, a gap in the coverage. And however hard the surgeon works, you don't want them uh, having doing so many things on the sure. days they're working that they, they, they you know, potentially endanger the uh, the patients yeah, or yeah. something so yeah there are certain jobs where yeah. you can't do it um, you you can't work from home 
if you're working on the railways or something. Sure. You know, you, it, there's many areas which it's just not yeah. possible uh, for some types of flexible working to occur. And this does suggest that, you know, we could be in for a kind of two-tier labour force where all the people in nice jobs like yours and mine uh, spend a lot of time uh, working from home mm. and picking up the kids and all that kind of stuff, where other poor so-and-sos are, are having to, you know, graft uh, in a, tra a, a more traditional way. Maybe Maybe over time, of course, the market could reflect that in terms of paying people like you and me less mm. and paying people who actually have to do a shift, sure. uh, <laughs> paying yeah, them more, but uh, more. that doesn't yeah. necessarily work out. And another area, and I'm not sure if it quite falls under the flexible working category, but is the right to disconnect, which of course we're hearing a lot more about at the moment. And again, there are simply some instances in which you are not going to be able to disconnect between the hours of 5pm and 9am the next morning. Yes, uh, of course, some countries have actually brought in uh, legislation which uh, you know, supposedly protects people from being wrong at home outside the, uh, the standard working hours. Uh, France has this, Ireland has this I think. Um, the, the, the problem with that type of flexible working uh, thing, though, is it may conflict with other things which you want to do. Mm -hmm. So, that, for example, if you're working, uh, part of your arrangement is you're working from, let's say, 7 in the morning till four in the afternoon and other people are working from ten in the morning till seven o'clock at night or something like that to give them greater flexibility then the uh, you know the period in which these overlap and people can c contact each other is going to be very small so you get these kind of complications mm -hmm. when you when you you say it's it's open house for any type of flexible yeah. working we must agree to it then you're going to create problems I think and I expect that when it comes to a right to disconnect that then employers will want their employees to be absolute nose to the grindstone between, let's say, the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. And there won't be any of the sort of informal, perhaps popping online, uh, going out to the shops, um, getting those errands done that you might do during working hours. So I think ultimately flexible working just need to be a bit careful about what you wish for. Oh, indeed. Um, <laughs> and on that note, we'll wrap up there. But thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much to Len for joining me once again. And if you enjoyed this, please do like the video. Consider subscribing to the IEA YouTube channel. And also, if you really liked it, uh, do consider being a digital patron to the IEA YouTube channel on Patreon, details of which are in the show notes below. Many thanks. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.